In previous videos, we've learned about glycolysis. And we know glycolysis is when we take a glucose molecule, we do a bunch of chemical reactions, eventually converting that glucose molecule into pyruvate molecules. However, once we form this pyruvate, now what? Now what do we do with the pyruvate? Well, normally what happens is the pyruvate enters inside of the mitochondria. So this glycolysis was occurring in the cytoplasm. However, once we produce the, those pyruvates, then they start entering inside the mitochondria. Now, once it's in the mitochondria, it goes through one quick reaction, forming an acetyl-CoA molecule. Now that we have this acetyl-CoA in the mitochondria, now we can begin the Krebs cycle. So let's draw this mitochondria larger so we have more space. So once this acetyl-CoA molecule is inside the mitochondria, Chondria, now we can start the Krebs cycle. And the first step is taking this four carbon oxaloacetate molecule and reacting it with this acetyl CoA molecule. When we do that, we form this citrate molecule. And it's important to realize that this oxaloacetate is a four carbon compound, acetyl CoA is a two carbon compound, so therefore we form a six carbon citrate molecule. But now we form the citrate molecule, now we do one other quick step essentially forming it in an isomer, forming this isocitrate. Now that we have the isocitrate, now we can continue with the Krebs cycle. We do another quick step, and in this step, it's pretty important because one, we produce a reduced NADH, and this is really important. We'll explain why this reduced NADH is really important, but also we go through a decarboxylation. We lose a CO2 group. This this, CO, this carbon and this, this carboxyl group is essentially lost as a CO2 molecule forming alpha-ketoglutarate. And again, this was a six carbon compound, so then we lost one carbon, so we were left with this five carbon alpha ketoglutarate. And again, we also produced this NADH. So now we do another step. And now we do another step, and in this other step, again, we lose another carbon in the form of CO2, and we create another reduced NADH. So again, it's, it's so already in these first few steps, we've done a lot of action. We've already created some reduced NADHs and some carbon dioxides. And also when we go through this particular step, we form the Cessnil-CoA, which has this high energy thioester bond. So we've created this compound with a high energy thioester bond, which we can hydrolyze. And when we hydrolyze this bond, we go through another step and we can use the energy in that high energy thiosulfur bond to produce an ATP molecule, one of these high energy ATP molecules. So that's important. And some species, in fact, they actually create GTP that turns into ATP. But the point is, in this step, we produce some of these high energy ATP molecules. Now that we have succinate, now we do another quick reaction. And in this reaction, we actually produced a reduced FADH2 cofactor. So then we have, then we again, we do another step forming malate. And then once we have malate, we do one last step. And in this last step, we produce another reduced NADH. And then in this last step, we create that oxaloacetate. And now we can do the whole cycle over again. Now we have another glucose molecule. We oxidize it to pyruvate which then gets converted to a new acetyl-CoA molecule, which can react with this oxaloacetate, and we can do the whole cycle over again. That's why it's called a cycle. But something important to realize is each step, each one of these individual steps required their own unique enzyme. For example, citrate into isocitrate required its own unique enzyme. Each of these steps requires an enzyme to catalyze that chemical reaction. And if you're curious, these are the particular enzymes. And this particular enzyme, taking this isocitrate and converting it into alpha-ketoglutarate, this step is very important. This is how we regulate the Krebs cycle. If we activate this, this enzyme, we do lots of the Krebs cycle. If this enzyme is, is inhibited, we don't do a lot of the Krebs cycle. So if you're curious, these are the things that activate the Krebs cycle, and these are the things that inhibit the Krebs cycle. But again, it's this enzyme you should associate with regulation of the Krebs cycle. But why do we do the Krebs cycle in the first place? Why do we take these acetyl-CoA molecules, react them with oxaloacetate, and go through all these steps in the first place? Why is this ubiquitous in nearly all cells in our body, besides red blood cells? But, but why is this so common? Well, when we do the Krebs cycle, again, we produce these reduced cofactors. We've created this NADH and this FADH2, and again, we also created one of these high-energy ATP molecules. And now when we created these reduced cofactors, so as we do the Krebs cycle, we produce these reduced cofactors. And we know these reduced cofactors can essentially fuel the electron transport chain. And when we fuel the electron transport chain, then we create more ATP. So that's why we do the Krebs cycle. When we do the Krebs cycle, we create these reduced cofactors, which can fuel the electron transport chain to create a lot of ATP. So how exactly does this work?
And again, something else important to realize is we can actually take proteins and break those peptide bonds releasing amino acids and oxidize them into acetyl-CoA. Or we can take carbohydrates like we talked about with glucose and other carbohydrates, oxidize them to eventually form acetyl-CoA. We can take fats and go through beta oxidation and convert them to acetyl-CoAs. And even certain parts of nucleic acids like the ribose Car carbohydrate groups, we can do some modifications and convert to acetyl-CoA, but that's pretty interesting. This is a way we can take nearly all macromolecules in our bodies, oxidize them to create acetyl-CoA molecules, and enter the Krebs cycle to create ATP. This is a way, if we need ATP, to use a lot of common biomolecules in our bodies to, to, to essentially create these reduced cofactors to create ATP. But again, Remember, this is occurring inside the mitochondria. We're doing the Krebs cycle inside the mitochondria, creating all these reduced cofactors. Remember, they're in, in pink, these reduced cofactors, which we know can fuel the electron transfer chain to create ATP. So how exactly does this happen? Well, again, now let's, let's focus on this part of, of the mitochondria. So again, we know we did the Krebs cycle and we, we created a lot of these reduced cofactors, which we explained can fuel the electron transfer chain to create ATP. So how do we do this? Well, essentially what happens is we have this electron transport chain. And in this electron transport chain, we, we go through redox reactions where this NADH had these, this source of electrons. So then we can go through redox reactions where we donate those electrons to complex one, which donates those electrons to these electron transporters, which again, donate the electrons to complex two, which donates, and, then, and we keep on doing these, these redox reactions where we eventually donate the electrons to complex four, which eventually donates the electrons to oxygen. Oxygen, that's actually why we need oxygen to be the final electron acceptor of the electron transport chain. However, if we have oxygen, it can accept these electrons and we can go through the, the electron transport chain. So NADH donates its electrons to complex one, which goes through this process. But again, we also have FADH2, which donates its, its electrons to complex two, which again, keeps donating its electrons eventually to complex three, then to complex four, then again, eventually to oxygen. But something important to realize are these redox reactions are very energetically favorable. They're very thermodynamically favorable. They're exergonic. And it's a little complex why, but essentially oxygen has a very high reduction potential, a very high intrinsic positiveness. And then complex four also has a pretty high reduction potential. Then it gets a little less and less. But the point is, as we donate these negatively charged electrons to complex with co uh, compounds with high reduction potentials as these negatively charged electrons go to compounds with higher and higher positive reduction potentials that's thermodynamically favorable. So these redox reactions in this electron transfer chain is very thermodynamically favorable. So when we do these energetically favorable redox reactions, we can use that energy to pump hydrogens into this inner membrane space, into this inner membrane space. So as we do these redox reactions, we use the energy from the, those thermodynamically favorable redox reactions to pump hydrogen ions into this inner membrane space. And as we keep on doing this, eventually we'll accumulate a large amount of hydrogen ions in this inner membrane space. So as we keep on doing the Krebs cycle, creating these reduced cofactors, fueling the electron transfer chain, we'll keep pumping hydrogen ions into this inner membrane space. So as we keep doing that, we create a huge hydrogen ion concentration, a huge electrochemical gradient with a lot of hydrogen ions in this inner membrane space. And we can use that. We know there's energy in that gradient. So essentially what happens is we have this really neat enzyme referred to as ATP synthase. And essentially what happens is it allows these, this hydrogen ion concentration to shoot down its gradient. And as these hydrogen ions shoot down their gradient, they essentially spin this, the, they spin a component of this ATP synthase, which essentially smashes an NA, ADP and an inorganic phosphate into forming ATP. So that's pretty interesting. This hydrogen ion gradient shoots down its gradient and essentially forms ATP. And in fact, it's through this electron transport chain where we create nearly 90% of all ATP in our body. Yeah, in the cytoplasm, we, we did glycolysis to create a little bit of ATP, but the vast majority of the ATP we create is through this electron transport chain. And in fact, that's why we need oxygen. Remember, oxygen had a very high electric potential, uh, high reduction potential, a very high positiveness. So therefore, it could act as the final electron acceptor. And as, as we donate electrons to compounds with higher and higher reduction potentials, we know that was thermodynamically favorable. And fortunately, we had oxygen to be the final electron acceptor to allow the electron transport chain to work. So therefore, we could create uh, so, so we could let this process continue so we can create the vast majority of our ATP. If we didn't have oxygen in our cells, for example, if, if some unfortunate situation occurred where our cells couldn't get oxygen, 
we couldn't, they couldn't accept electrons in the electron transport chain. And then these electrons would all get stuck here. There would be a bunch of electrons stuck on this complex four. And again, that we would essentially back up this electron transport chain and we wouldn't be able to do the electron transport chain. So we wouldn't be able to create the vast majority of the ATP that we, we need in our body. This is where we create the vast majority of the ATP and we need oxygen in order to do this process. So the point is, the Krebs cycle, which occurs in the mitochondria, the reason why we do the Krebs cycle is to create these reduced cofactors to fuel the electron transport chain to create ATP. However, this is re referred to as aerobic respiration. It's aerobic because we need oxygen. We need oxygen to allow this electron transport chain to work to create the vast majority of our ATP. But this is why we do the Krebs cycle.